Welcome everybody. We're so pleased that you've joined us this evening. I'm Tammy Northam, Bladder Cancer Canada's Executive Director. All right, so there I am. And I'm your MC for the session tonight on sexuality and intimacy when facing bladder cancer. This is a topic which we know is commonly of concern for many facing bladder cancer, and it's one which can significantly impact quality of life for patients and their partners. It's also a topic that isn't talked about as much as it needs to be, so we hope that tonight's webinar will answer some of the questions you may have. You may have thought about, but, <laughs> about asking, but haven't. And most importantly, we hope you come away with tips and resources to help you enrich your quality of life. Before we get any further though, we have a few housekeeping items to go over. First, to ensure your best possible audio experience, we, we have all of you on mute in order to minimize the amount of background noise. While you'll be able to hear us speaking, we're not going to be able to hear you. So if you have a comment or question during the session, the best way to submit your question on a computer is to type it into the question box at the bottom of your GoToWebinar panel. If you are on a mobile device like a tablet or a cell phone, click on the question mark icon. Please keep in mind that we will not be able to address questions that are specific to your case but we will do our best to answer as many of the general questions as we can during the Q&A session following the presentation. If we don't have time to answer your question this evening, we will address it in a summary document which will be sent to you via email in the coming days. If you find that you're experiencing technical issues, please send us a note in the question box and stick with us as we work to solve the problem. Lastly, we are recording this session so if you get called away or disconnected, keep in mind, you will receive the recording via email in the coming days. To help us to understand the composition of our audience tonight, please respond to the poll that will appear on your screen at any moment now. All right, let's give this a try. Okay, so we'll give you about uh, 15 to 20 seconds to answer this uh, anonymous poll. Totally optional, but again, it's anonymous. So we're just collecting the responses here now. Live as we speak. And we're just about to close this off. So let's close it off. There we go. And now I'm going to share the results with you. All right, so it looks like we've got 74% bladder cancer patient or survivor, 31% um, is a partner, 9% is a caregiver, 6% healthcare professional, 3% others. So there we go. So thank you for that. So we'll get back to our slides. All right. So, <clears throat> I will kick off tonight's presentation with a short introduction on Bladder Cancer Canada, often referred to as BCC. So just to give you a bit of an overview, we are the first and only national and patient-focused bladder cancer organization. We were co-founded in 2009, almost 10 years ago, by two gentlemen by the name of Jack Moon and David Gutman. Our mission is threefold, which is to support patients increase awareness and education about bladder cancer and fund research into bladder cancer. Who are we? Well, we are a national board of directors with uh, 10 volunteers, a mix of patients and professionals. You'll see a photo of our gang there below. At our last meeting, we're made up of one full-time and four part-time staff. Um, I am the full-time staff and two of the part-time staff are here on the line with us this evening. We have over 300 volunteers, and over 7,000 people are registered with us to receive information and updates. All right, so let's talk a little bit about our medical advisory board. So uh, we have 26 individuals on our board, uh, top specialists in bladder cancer made up of urologists, oncologists, radiation oncologists. You'll see a picture of some of them here to the left at our last in-person meeting. And we advise on um, research in the area of research. Uh, re they help us review patient support materials. They help support our activities. They promote us in their local communities and are working on develop 
developing standards of care. So that's just a few of the things they help us with, but this is a purely volunteer position that these people uh, are, are involved with. So we truly appreciate that. Moving along, so this is our website. If you haven't seen it, I'm sure you probably have, but full of great resources, highly credible and informative. And we encourage you to check that out often. Still talking about support, our one-to-one -one patient support program. So these are some of the individuals involved as volunteers in this program. Uh, Jack Moon moderates the discussion forum and has done since the beginning as one of the co-founders. Randy Smith oversees as a volunteer our, our peer support program and Val McLeod, McLeod highly involved as well. Um, so we, we, we deal with a lot of these inqu inquiries over the phone, uh, through email or through our discussion forum. We have about over 40 volunteers involved with this program and lining up individuals with others who uh, have similar backgrounds from similar geographic regions, similar diagnoses, so that they can share their experiences. And of course, we host education meetings across Canada each year. We just had one last week in Ottawa. Uh, you may have been in attendance at, but we host approximately six in-person meetings per year moving them around to various locations across the country. We also have support groups in quite a few cities. So if you're interested in that, you can check out our website and see where some of those support groups are running. And of course the webinars, you're on one this evening. So we do have another one targeted for next winter, 2019. And we're always looking for ideas or feedback around topics that you'd be interested in hearing about in the future. So these were a couple of the ideas that came up, but please send us your suggestions. And our patient guidebooks, another great resource. We have a new book coming out in the new year on metastatic bladder cancer to add to the series. So that will be the fourth guidebook in available, all available in English and French. So you can download these from our website for free but we also distribute them to urologists' office across Canada for free. Uh, the content you can also find directly on our website. And in addition to that, we have videos and we do post these webinars. So we record it, we post it, and we place it up on our website for future reference. All right. So let's talk a little bit about public awareness. We've got a couple more minutes here. So probably many of you would have seen our See Red, See Your Doctor awareness campaign. Uh, the familiar red lemon, most of the advertising space is donated. Um, the major cost we have is printing, but overall this program is run at very low cost and brings a lot of awareness to uh, the early, early sign of bladder cancer, the most common early sign, which is blood in the urine. We also have volunteer community ambassadors distributing our brochures across the country. And we have our Sea Red brochures placed in 1700 GP offices across the country. And Awareness Month is May. So that's an international day that is celebrated across the world to promote bladder cancer awareness. And in 2019, we'll be focusing on the 10 year anniversary of Bladder Cancer Canada, and it will be a year long, not just May, but a year long uh, celebration of the anniversary of the organization. So let's talk about the third pillar, research. So bladder cancer, as many of you will know, is the fifth most common cancer in Canada, and yet ranks 19th in research funding among the top 24 cancers. So this is a really big focus for us. It's very important to um, you know, raise more funds and um, ensure that more research is going into bladder cancer. And, and one more thing that we, we, we don't have necessarily as part of our mission, but we, uh, um, we, we stress is very critical is our advocacy efforts. So access to new and effective treatments, ensuring supply of critical drugs, being the Canadian voice for bladder cancer patients, ensuring patients are aware about their right to a second opinion, 
early diagnosis, earlier diagnostic screening, and increasing research funding, as I mentioned before, all very critical. And I couldn't leave here today without uh, telling you about the Bladder Cancer Canada Awareness Walk. Uh, they took it took place in 21 cities across Canada in September, raising to date $590,000 nationally and, and represents 65% of our revenues for the year. And next year's date, September 22nd, 2019. So if you're signed up with us to receive our newsletter, you'll hear more about that. And finally, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody. I'm going to move along this evening to turn things over to our first presenter. I'm going to introduce to you now Janet Giroux. Jan has been a nurse for over 36 years, working in both inpatient and outpatient units at the Kingston Health Sciences Centre. Jan is a lifelong learner. For the past 12 years, she has been working as a gynecology oncology advanced practice nurse, and for the past nearly three years as a nurse practitioner in the Cancer Centre's sexual health clinic. So Jan, I'm gonna turn things over to you. Thank you. And thank you again for inviting me to present on this very um, important topic on quality of life and often remain silent. Uh, next slide, please. And I do apologize up front because I am presenting from the hospital, so there may be occasional emergency announcements over the system. It's repeated three times, so I might pause because one of the uh, speakers is right over my head. So what I ask patients who come to see me in my sexual health clinic is to uh, look at how do you change or adapt and for, pass up or let go of the old way of doing things and try to build new ways of um, changing what you've been left with as a result of your cancer diagnosis and treatment. Next slide. I'd also like to explore with you um, the sexual health and intimacy changes for both men and women, patients and partners, and discuss some practical ways in dealing with the changes. Again, I have not gained any financial gains from my work in sexual health except for my being employ employed as a hospital employee. Uh, I've not done research, however, I am currently uh, investigating a patient satisfaction survey in my cancer clinic, uh, sexual health run clinic, uh, which I co-run with a nurse social worker. She runs a clinic two days, two, sorry, two mornings a month, and I run two clinics in the afternoon a month. And um, we've been able to drop our wait time down to booking in one to two months for visits. At one time, I had a six month wait list. I'm not a sex therapist and I am not ris recommending any risky behaviors for this presentation. Next slide, please. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues in the Cancer Center who have supported me with this adventure. And I, through the D'Souza Institute, I have now have my D'Souza APN or Advanced Practice Nurse designation, the fourth nurse in Canada to achieve that. And I did it through doing a continuing education in sexual health and cancer with a fellowship working with both um, different colleagues who practice this type of care provision. And then I also have multiple members on an advisory committee that I can seek out advice from and guidance and allow um, immediate referrals if I need additional help to manage complex cases. Next slide, please. So, what we do know in Canada in 2017 that one in two Canadians will develop cancer in their lifetime and unfortunately cancer treatments come with a cost and what we have to balance that out with survival and quality of life. From a perspective of side effects, all treatments 
surgery, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, radiation, hormone therapy, and even surveillance can impact quality of life and sexual um, function and intimacy. Next slide. Dr. Katz, who is a advanced practice nurse in Manitoba, runs sexual health and is a sex therapist, and uh, Don Dizon have just released a new article on a paper regarding sexuality after cancer, a model for male survivors. And although they've written this for male survivors, I feel that this is appropriate for both men and women, not the intended purpose of the model, but at the beginning is the input of what the society is sending messages to the community. And when it comes to sexual drive and communication, it comes down to what is the expectations of what sexual performance should be. What we do know is that the body responds and has different changes as a result of sexual, uh, sorry, as a result of cancer treatments and diagnosis. But what we also understand and what I really appreciate in this model is that it incorporates the partner as well and what satisfaction and pleasure can actually be. Next slide, please. So what I've asked my clients to think about is how do you respond differently given the scenario that you're facing? And some patients and some healthcare providers are sometimes intimidated by opening up a Pandora's box. And some clients are actually a little bit nervous when they first come to meet with me. And within five minutes, you can just see a sense of ease and relaxation take place because um, they're actually starting to feel comfortable in talking with me about their concerns. Next slide. So what we also know in the healthcare field is that healthcare providers need to address sexual health and intimacy concerns with patients. Next slide. And what we do know is that there are concerns and barriers that cause healthcare providers to not do this. And the major issue is that there is a lack of knowledge and training to deal with this particular issue. It's only been recently in the last decade where we're starting to have more education in this field. Many healthcare providers have a sense of discomfort. It's not just the patient who's uncomfortable with the topic. And again, it's a perspective of what that healthcare provider perceives their role to be. And at the end of the day, what we do know is that it's often a lack of time and privacy to provide this intense, complex counseling. These are not five-minute conversations that take place. It's often, for me, when I see patients in my clinic, it takes 30 minutes, if not an hour or more, to um, provide this counseling and education. Next slide. So why are we here? Most are, are interested in either learning how to um, address this issue for themselves and or for healthcare providers to communicate with their clients. And so what I would like to talk about is how do we change what's happening and tools and um, recommendations to assist you. Next slide. And one of the key findings that I have to do in my clinic is dispel any kind of myths that some clients have. And sometimes it can just be purely what they are and are not able to do in the future because sometimes if not told, then they do not explore for themselves. Next slide. So I have to admit that I've adapted some of the slides with some permission from um, Cancer Care Ontario presentation on it's time to start the conversation. And Cancer Care Ontario has made this a focus in the last couple of years to enhance um, education and just start a conversation in regards to sexual health. Back in 2013, um, in a study with prostate cancer patients, found that sexual dysfunction is one of the lasting side effects of treatment that creates the greatest loss for men and their partners. And keep advancing the slide, please. And what we do know is that quality of life is part of sexuality and it involves the body image, intimacy and in relationships, communication and sexual response. Next slide, please. 
And one of the key factors in many people who learn about counseling is that we refer to a biopsychosocial model because we know that it's not just physical or function, it also includes many other dimensions. Next slide. And we're going to go through that. So what are these dimensions? Well, I've already alluded that physical is a huge component, but psychological and emotional is also um, significant. Social and relationship, information and spiritual. Next slide, please. From a physical perspective, one of the number one complaints that cancer patients have is the fatigue that is somewhat overwhelming uh, in many occasions. We'll talk a little bit about the impacts of that, but loss of libido or that desire to have sex when you're struggling with so many other issues, um, sexual function seems to drop down very low and it's deprioritized. Vaginal changes for women, particularly if a woman has her bladder removed, the intimacy of the bladder with the reproductive organs is uh, generally also removed. So a woman who may not be menopausal will have her ovaries removed, which then pre creates an instant menopause. Uh, if menopause is not just about sweats and hot flashes, it significantly changes the vaginal capacity um, and changes um, comfort level of penetrative intercourse, but also uh, the uterus is removed, which may change some of the orgasm changes that women may have experienced prior. And also depending on the nature and extensive uh, work that's required to remove the bladder, often a woman's vagina is also um, either fully compromised or t sacrificed or partially. And depending on who's doing any kind of repair work with the closure, um, some doctors view the, the width of the vagina being more important than the depth. And depending on the type of repair that's taking place, that can either be a, a longer vagina that's created but narrow or a shorter vagina, but wider. So again, that in either case causes significant ramifications for a woman who wishes to engage in penetrative intercourse again in the future. Pain can be a result of surgery or other treatments that are taking place. Penile changes for men. We know all kinds of evidence and research and much of our current understanding of sexual health and cancer comes from the literature and research for men with prostate cancer and for women with breast or below the belt reproductive cancers. And what we do know for a man who has his, pro his bladder removed, he's also having his prostate removed at the same time. And the seminal vessels, vesicles and also um, the nerves, it's like, I think of it as like a cobweb around the prostate and the nerves that help with erectile function are generally sacrificed in this type of surgery. Whereas sometimes you might hear with men who have prostate cancer surgery, they may have a nerve sparing um, surgery taking place. And in that case, they're trying to preserve erectile function uh, down the road. Also, what we do know is that um, with this surgery for men, I would probably have to say almost all men with with uh, bladder removal will have some type of erectile dysfunction and also generally over time there's a decrease or shrinkage of the penis size. Orgasm changes will significantly change with surgery, um, an inability to possibly reach an orgasm, loss of ejaculate, um, Men can have an orgasm without an erection, and that's a common misunderstanding. And uh, they may actually leak urine um, with a climax or an orgasm. And some patients will report painful orgasms, especially the first few times when they're trying to engage in having um, uh, an erection, an orgasm, and hopefully over time that tends to subside. If this is for an, um, a survivor who is dealing with um, 
this surgery and they still would have liked to have fathered a child or for a woman who would have liked to have been able to have a, a pregnancy, infertility can be um, significant for some couples. And then again, with significant urinary and bowel changes as a result of different treatments. Next, next slide. What we also think of the sexual response cycle is more of a linear uh, response. You have to be aroused and then you have your orgasm and then there's a resolution time. For some men, the resolution time can be days versus for women who tend to be a little bit more fortunate, they can have uh, multiple orgasms in one sexual encounter. Um, from the psychological or emotional effects of uh, cancer and treatment, uh, there's often a sense of vulnerability and worry about loved ones, the concern about the reaction of one's sexual partner with all the changes in treatment and what life might be, mean for them, the changes in body image and significantly for those with an ostomy, um, a lowered self-esteem and some uh, men have actually reported that they really feel very cheated about their manhood if they cannot have an erection. Another significant thing that I work with patients is the anxiety, depression and or anger um, associated with these multiple changes and the hope that um, even though they heard the physician talk about the possibility of sexual health changes due to the treatments, many believe that it just will not happen to them and then there's significant grief and loss and sometimes a sense of loneliness that occurs after uh, treatment has taken place and trying to manage with the aftermath. Uh, fear of relapse, I've just done a research study on fear of cancer recurrence and I've had many um, clients tell me that the fear doesn't go away, hopefully it diminish, diminishes over time. And then the fear or concern about the devotion that one has with their partner and the fear that they may be abandoned down the road. Next slide. From a social or relationship effects, they struggle Many couples struggle with resuming sexual activity because the rules and the sexual script that they're used to having totally goes out the door with um, the changes that are taking place. Um, they start to question whether they're um, attractive to their partner. They start to question whether their partner finds that they're um, sexy anymore. There's a lot of distress that can be associated on the sec the partner's uh, perspective because if I try to show any interest then maybe my partner's not going to be happy with me so I should maybe just not do any kind of initiation of um, a sexual script uh, but I still really want my partner to know that I love them and care for them and I miss the hugs, I miss the kisses but then there's a fear that maybe there's an assumption that something more will take place if I show any kind of signs of intimacy. The relationship satisfaction tends to go down and tension and distress will go up and as I said there's often a fear of abandonment. Next slide please. From an informational point of view, I spend time trying to help patients learn how to address their um, feelings through communication strategies. I encourage clients to use I statements. I miss it when you touch me here versus saying you don't touch me anymore. That puts the, per the partner on a defensive mode and questions themselves and so I really try to encourage clients to think about I statements and really think about what they wish to say before they say it to their partner and it comes down to renegotiating um, roles and normalizing. I spent I just validate what you're actually going through. I do tr provide some re-education on anatomy and function and change in that sexual script and I do examine uh, women and help them understand what kind of vagina they may still have remaining. Products and tools, I do uh, show clients what vibrators and dilators and um, sex toys can look like and try to decrease the um, 
uh, uncomfortable position or that awkward feeling that you may have, especially if you haven't pursued any kind of other sexual uh, toys or such in the past or products to help. And again, I really strongly encourage mindfulness exercises because it helps decrease the distracting thoughts that can creep in while you're trying to enjoy pleasure with either yourself or your partner. Next slide. So from a spiritual component, it's about finding areas that you have strength. And that's where I ask patients, where do you get that strength from? What is really important to you? What gives you comfort? And sometimes they'll come out and just say to me, I really just like cuddling with my husband or my wife. And sense that closeness that we haven't been able to share for some time and giving patients um, support. Um, hope is important and uncertainty is always there, but again, it's important to um, explore those feelings. Next slide. So it's about opening the door. Next slide. To conversations. And um, what we do know is that we have to have the right environment and time and training, resources and the comfort level. And what we do know from, 19, from 2007, still 96% of healthcare professionals felt it was important to talk about it, but only about 2% did address it. Next slide. Cancer Care Ontario has brought out the intervention and says that this does cause significant sexual distress and a burden to many uh, uh, patients. About 60% of men and about 50% of women do express concerns in this issue and we're trying to raise the awareness and educate more healthcare professionals. Next slide. So what is the unmet needs during this difficult news? When you're hearing that you have cancer diagnosis, the first thought is how do we treat this? And then we'll deal with other issues like quality of life and sexual health later. Next slide. So what are those possible concerns? And patients start coming to me to try to reclaim their sex life. Next slide. So this is about for both men and women. Next slide. And uh, Beck did a research study with men with prostate cancer and he had three pillars and it was about being persistent, being flexible and being um, accepting. And what we do know is that maintaining or reestablishing a sex satisfying sexual intimacy involves redefining sex as not just about penetration, embracing intimacy, possibly using some sexual aids or medical aids, and really building on communication and relationship. Next slide. So when it comes to bladder cancer, let's focus on some of this. Next slide. Identifying the risks was the treatments, why are we doing what we're doing, and then the treatment thereafter. Next slide. So from a CISTO um, perspective, um, it could be through investigations or through treatments. Again, um, many patients complain about having burning, pain, stinging, pitching, pinching sensation, and a need to urgently uh, pass urine frequently. Many will notice blood. There's a fear that they're going to pass their cancer to the, or their partners. They're afraid that um, with certain precautions and treatments, you need to use a condom and also possibly contraception uh, during the treatment phase. Next slide. What we also know is that with repeated cystos, some people just say, I, my um, genitalia is not a place for desire or for sex now. There are some often sometimes temporary pain with erections or ejaculations. Some people have pain with intercourse after these procedures. Uh, may have some negative body image, a sense that the genital area is contaminated now. And next slide. So what about the aftermath? And sometimes uh, healthcare providers will use words that doesn't make sense to everybody, but they might say, is the plumbing still working down there? And they might, you might be thinking they're talking about, are you passing urine okay? But this could be your opportunity to open up the door to say, well, actually I'm passing urine okay, or that part's working, but my sexual health is not so good. And can we talk about that? Next slide. 
So from being from caregiver to sexual partner, how do you make that adjustment after you've been helping your partner, caring for uh, ostomy, wounds, et cetera, to being a loving couple and wanting to share intimacy? Next slide. So it's about learning how to adapt. Next slide. And it's about a journey to solutions. And it's really about reframing and acknowledging that grief, recognizing the fears, changes that may not necessarily be the same, might not be able to have those possible enjoyments again. But it's about re choosing to remain open, discussing those feelings, exploring different options, and staying committed to homework. This is not going to change unless you continue to practice and um, work at a solution. Next slide. So these are basic concepts and lifestyle factors. Stop smoking if you can. Limit alcohol. It actually is, um, it inhibits desire. A look at diet, maybe some of the foods you're eating that may change um, odor for you. Weight loss if there's a large panis because that can contribute to penile shortening as well um, or a large abdomen. Uh, exercise most days of the week which contributes to um, battling fatigue. Uh, trying to think about sleep and sleep hygiene and avoiding caffeine. Not having light sources on or TVs in the bedroom and um, leisure activities. Stress reduction and working uh, through relationship conflict. Next slide. As I mentioned, there's all kinds of reasons for, for fatigue. Talk to your healthcare providers about these and what could be areas of improvement to enhance your ability to cope better. Next slide. So going from uh, having backs to each other to being able to talk to each other and explore those feelings. Next slide. So uh, the cornerstone of sex therapy is something called sensate focused exercises. And what this is, is helps partners focus on the sensation rather than function or performance. So it's about partners giving and receiving pleasurable stimulation. It works at building trust and intimacy in a couple's relationship. And it actually focuses on um, staying focused on the pleasure and trying to avoid those distracting thoughts from coming in. Um, you can Google sensate focused exercises. Usually there's about four pages of uh, paperwork and you can either explore it through non-genital or genital uh, stimulation. This is, is structured but it can be flexible and homework is a priority and this was um, it's cornerstone of all of this was Masters and Johnson's work. Next slide. So one of the big issues for women in particular is the fear of pain or the first time they try to have penetrative intercourse, they experience significant pain. It can be a result of menopausal symptoms. Um, but what happens is that the body starts to anticipate pain and fear and anxiety, which then causes the body muscles to start to tense and there's uh, that moves through to painful sex and penetration can be impossible. Often partners have said that um, uh, they've said that their male partner has um, said that it feels like I'm having sex with a virgin again. Um, pain reinforced intensifies and then the body reacts by bracing and more ongoing basis and finally what ends up happening is couples start to avoid any form of intimacy for the fear that if I show any kind of sign of being interested or showing and, or kissing my partner it might mean or lead to something more that I'm not prepared to endure. Next slide. Pelvic physiotherapy is a very underutilized treatment. There are because uh, there are more pelvic physiotherapists being trained, and they are experts on pelvic floor muscles, biofeedback, and electrical stimulation. They do. Um, 
use their hands to help you learn different areas of stimulation or trigger points that might be spasm and muscle pain. It certainly helps with urinary incontinence management and it certainly can enhance sexual response. So what it does is it improves your self-awareness and confidence and feelings of empowerment and it can decrease lower anxiety and actually help with function and performance. Next slide. However, what's really important is that you do not back away from your partner and you build that physical affection of holding hands, hugging, personal touch and kissing and cuddling and the relationship int um, intimacy and shared um, massage genital caressing, mutual masturbation. Think of outer course versus intercourse and what you can accomplish. Thinking about bringing in sex toys and possibly even oral sex. Next slide. Um, pelvic radiation is a targeted treatment. It does impact bowel, bladder, bones and sexual organs in the field. Next slide. And with women, the vaginal capacity canal is actually in that target zone for radiation and what I encourage um, patients to do is have va vaginal dilators um, think of it as rehabilitation if you had a stroke you would learn how to walk if you had um, weak hand or arm you would use maybe a squeeze ball to practice your flexibility and gain your strength back so I ask uh, patients to use vaginal dilation two to three times per week. It helps prevent vaginal stenosis, adhesions, painful intercourse. It helps you identify what is the depth of penetration and gain some confidence in what you can do. And it does help with vaginal exa pelvic examinations in the future. Next slide. Um, Basson is a psychologist who works out of British Columbia who developed a model for women, um, sexual response, and for particularly when that natural libido or desire tanks. Um, it, she's developed this model to help uh, women understand that based on being receptive to stimuli, maybe that, that response can be adaptive and through work you can become sexually aroused and have satisfaction through a sexual encounter. Next slide. For women, vaginal moisturizers certainly help, particularly for a menopausal vagina. When women say that they have, it feels like they have uh, sandpaper in their vagina, very painful intercourse. Vaginal lubricants, which can also be used on penises, helps with external um, uh, moisture, which then helps with the dryness and adds to sexual pleasure for clitoral stimulation, penetration, and for men who wish, wish to have um, masturbation or mutual masturbation, it can certainly help so that there's no um, pain associated with prolonged masturbation to have an orgasm. Next slide. When it comes to menopause, the vagina actually, um, the elasticity or the stretch decreases, there's significant vaginal dryness and the vaginal canal can actually shorten and uh, become drier. Um, and in some cases, we utilize a local estrogen treatment to restore some of that integrity and bring that moisture back to the vagina, similar to what takes place on the inside of your mouth and your gums um, to restore that health. Next slide. Sex with an ostomy has multiple um, issues related to it. It's often having confidence, self-esteem, trust in your partner, um, anticipate um, issues that may change from emptying and having a clean pouch, making sure the seal's tight, wishing to use maybe um, opaque or uh, pouch cover, um, positioning of the pouch maybe to the side versus straight down, also using being creative with lingerie, cummerbunds, wraps to conceal the pouch and just having comfortable positions and being comfortable with your partner. And as a reminder, your stoma is not a sex organ. It can cause herniation and all kinds of issues and problems um, for the stoma if you're thinking of trying to use it instead of the vagina. Next slide.
or an anus. So erectile dysfunction, I think of it as more of a symphony. It requires a number of factors, hormones, musculature, um, uh, blood supply, and nerve inputs. It also means having the ability to have an erection or the inability to get hard enough for penetration or feel comfortable having um, masturbation. Also the inability to maintain an erection through to completion of intercourse. So it's about the ability of the man to be able to have an erection that can be satisfying. Um, the actual prevalence is 50% for all men and aging does make a difference and impacts this. And it can be associated also with having orgasm problems, ejaculation problems, or actually the shape of the penis and having some curvature. Next slide. There's multiple medical management for erectile dysfunction and we'll go through those now. Next slide. So PD-5 inhibitors tend to be the first treatment and when we look at treatment for ED, erectile dysfunction, we try to identify the risk factors. So was it primary? And one of the first things I ask clients when they come to see me is what was their function and their sexual script like before their cancer diagnosis? And do they have diabetes or other, or other vascular or heart disease that may be impacting their um, function. Uh, erectile dysfunction can be associated with different medications. What is their diagnosis and then how to counsel them appropriately and treat any dysfunction with either medications or devices. And again, homework, homework, homework. And I ask patients to turn the clock around and not focus on how much time it takes to have pleasure, but to just enjoy the pleasure. Next slide. So uh, PD-5 inhibitors, most patients understand this when I say the word Viagra. Um, different medications are all being used and um, Viagra um, actually is impacted by uh, food intake and for some people, they seem to think that if they take this medication, an erection is just miraculously going to happen. It does require sexual stimulation and also it does require time for it to take effect. So if you're struggling, it's not going to work in 30 minutes. It often takes 60 minutes or even longer to take effect. And if one agent does not work. That doesn't mean that they're all not going to work. Cialis is one of the drugs that I find is um, sometimes a little bit more beneficial because it is not impacted by food intake. It can be used on a daily basis or otherwise some people know it as the weekender because it can last at a certain dose over 72 hours. So it's only in those cases taken um, maybe twice a week and it helps with unplanned sex. So it takes away some of that performance anxiety. Next slide. So one of the issues around it is that it comes with a multiple side effects. It can cause headaches, indigestion, flushing, nasal congestion, which can be problematic if you want to follow through with any kind of oral sex, dizziness, um, visual disturbance, blurred vision or blue halos. Some men will have back aches and myalgias and for some cases a prolonged painful erection. It is never normal to have an erection greater than four hours. It causes more tissue damage and more erectile dysfunction and you have to make a quick trip to the emergency department to declare it. And very rare can be um, poor blood supply to the optic nerve and change in vision or blindness. Next slide. As I said, contraindications can be if you have heart disease, angina, you cannot use this drug because nitrates or GTN decreases um, uh, blood pressures, which this medication was initially used as a cardiac disease and they found the benefits of men reporting um, the ability to have erections. Um, it does cause some problems with electrical activity um, for the heart, that QT interval, and it can also cause significant hypotension if you have an enlarged prostate and you're taking medications for that. There is some drug interactions 
Um, again, that's why it's always important to declare the medications that you're taking and having one pharmacy. Also, declaring any other supplements that you may be taking that could interfere. And again, the risk of prolonged uh, erections. Next slide. When it comes to vacuum erection devices, they can be very helpful for some patients. What they do is they engorge the penis with venous blood, not arterial blood. So the penis is blue, it can be cold. It does require a band to be put on and then that constriction band must be removed within 30 minutes. Unfortunately, the penis can pivot and at the base of the ring. So there can be some pain and discomfort with uh, penetrative intercourse. The penis is cold. Um, there can be some bruising. And again, there will not be an ejaculate with this um, device and there can be some discomfort and um, orgasm. It's generally not recommended in many cases if you're on blood thinners, aspirin, warfarin, or the new anticoagulants. And approximately $500 for a medical grade pump. For some patients who are questioning this device, I may ask them to consider picking up one between $50 and $100 at an adult store. Next slide. When it comes to Muse, these are little pellets that you insert into the penis. Uh, basically, the major side effect of this is that many men complain of significant penile pain and burning. It, some people have said it stings like a bee. So again, it can be a distractor, but for some people, uh, one treatment is approximately $35 and it can um, help with um, having an erection. Next slide. But for many men who end up having their prostates and their bladder removed and wish to pursue penetrative intercourse, generally speaking, these patients generally need to have what we would call an ICI injection. And that is putting an injection in the side of the shaft of the penis to allow, with stimulation, to allow uh, erect an erection. There is a risk of having a, an erection that lasts longer than it's supposed to and some fibrosis or scar tissue. However, there's significant success with this um, procedure. It's just a matter of getting past um, injecting yourself with an insulin type syringe, a little tiny needle, one sh needle um, into the shaft of the penis. Next slide. Penile implants are usually a last resort. Once you've done it, you can't go back. They may need to be changed. And what it is, is there's an, a pump is in, um, implanted that you can inflate and deflate the um, implant uh, to allow for penetrative intercourse in the future. Next slide. External devices. Uh, there's strap-ons that can be utilized to be able to have pleasure. There's a newer device in the last few years. This is out of the uh, U.S. and it's called the Elator. It's like, think of it as like a penile splint. I've had uh, the doctor that I work with in erectile dysfunction clinic say he's had one patient that's tried it, did not like it. He found it expensive. It's approximately $300 American. You do have to order the... Um, uh, the equipment to be able to measure your penis to get the right fit. However, there's been other counselors in Canada that have recommended it and had patients find it has been helpful. Next slide. And it can be for a flaccid, semi-erect um, penis as well. These resources can be available to you trying to get out of your discomfort zone of walking into an adult sexual health store. Um, one of my courses was that I had to go into one. I'd never been in one before. And what I discovered is that some of these stores are very resourceful. They're very helpful at helping you understand what kind of products they have that can be of use and be beneficial. They're honest, in my opinion, um, because they want um, to help you. And remember, anybody who's going there are generally all going there for the same reason. It can rekindle sexual interest. It can help with some experimentation and learning a new sexual script. And again, the Canadian Cancer Society has a book, Sex, Intimacy, and Cancer, as a resource. The American 
Cancer Society has one book dedicated to women and one book dedicated to men. Online, instead of going to a sexual adult store, you can order products online. Again, they're expensive. They come to you in a discreet package. These two, uh, Come As You Are and Good For Her, are based out of Toronto. New pair, or sorry, new slide. <laughs> Um, Breaking the Silence, Dr. Ann Katz, nurse practitioner, nurse, clinical nurse specialist in Cancer Care Manitoba, has written a book on Breaking the Silence for Cancer and Sexuality. It's a handbook for sexual uh, or healthcare providers. However, Women Cancer Sex and Man Cancer Sex are books written for the patient. And um, I was able to read those books quickly and one night um, I found them very helpful. They're patient stories and the issues that they've each faced in different types of cancer scenarios. Next slide. So the take home message is communication is required. It does take a need or an, there is a need to change your sexual script to enjoy pleasure again, maintain the intimacy in the relationship and consider asking for referrals for help. It's about embracing change. Next slide. I think that might be the end. That's the end. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Janet. Um, so we've got we've got a few questions in, but first I'd like to remind everyone that you can still ask questions, and the best way to do so is to type it into the question box on the go to panel on the right side of your screen. Um, again, Janet can't answer questions specific to your case, so keep them general. So um, now I'm going to turn it over to Carrie Carrie Abbott, BCC program manager, who has been compiling your questions this evening to read out uh, our first question. Hi, everybody. So uh, the first question that we got is, what is the safety of having intercourse during treatments? So for example, bladder installations. Good question. So some of these agents that are used are um, not, can, can be a contamination for, so like when we talk about chemotherapy, cytotoxic precautions. In Kingston, we recommend seven days of using precautions with any kind of chemotherapy agent. So it depends on what is being instilled in the bladder and getting guidance from your healthcare provider, whether there should be um, any additional precautions. And what about BCG? That was one that came up specifically. Yeah. So again, um, I've been told that we do recommend um, precautions. Um, again, seeking, I, I'm not somebody who instills this product, um, but again, I would recommend that you talk to your healthcare provider about any kind of precautions related to that. And another question that came up was uh, with regards to uh, turbots. So um, one lady has asked, um, so, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to make sense of the question here. Um, any? Yeah, I think it was. I think it was actually more in regards to um, surgery. So you know, harm to the patient after they've undergone cystectomy, for example. Do you have any suggestions for how long someone should wait after they've had a cystectomy before they can uh, be intimate? Good question. So I actually talked to one of the urologists this week about this and he basically recommended that it normally takes a minimum of good six to eight weeks for any kind of healing. He would not want any kind of a fistula to develop. So my recommendation, especially right after surgery, is to, if you're interested in wanting to know what kind of vagina is left or um, what that penetration can be to ask for a speculum exam to be done um, and then ensure that the suture lines inside the vagina are healed enough to allow for penetration. So that's for women. What about for men? For men, um, I would have to say for a man who's undergoing a radical cystectomy and having that kind of surgery, it's going to still take approximately six to eight weeks for that incision line to heal and probably adjusting to whether there is an internal um, bladder, pre um, sorry, neo, uh, I just lost my word, thought word of, um, sorry. Created bladder or yeah. stoma, and yeah. so again, most 
couples or patients tend to think I'm probably not that interested in engaging in penetrative or any kind of intimate contact in that region until the pain is subside, subsided. Um, one of the issues with all of this is that with one of the reasons why we as healthcare providers suggest not to do any heavy lifting, straining, pushing, pulling 10 pounds for six or eight weeks, part of that is a notion is that we're trying to avoid people from um, developing adhesions or uh, what we call a dehiscence or a um, a hernia from occurring. So again, um, being somebody who's had five surgeries myself, mm -hmm. I generally uh, I do not welcome any kind of significant contact in my incision lines over several weeks until I'm well healed. And so it, that question extends to, um, you know, other than intercourse, can yeah. You know, a male, for example, who would not necessarily have the weight being put on him. Um, yeah. Would he also have to wait that six to eight weeks if it weren't intercourse per se, but manual? Well, doing? like close touch and intimacy is still important um, when it comes to trying to see it, like trying to uh, self-stimulate or have the partner try to uh, masturbate. There's a, opportunities to explore. Um, if you're feeling up to it and it feels good, uh, sexual activity can provide some um, comfort. And so part of this is having confidence and trust in either your, uh, if self-exploring or partners. Hey, Carrie. So it's Tammy. I think we may have time for one more question if you've, if you've got uh, any more there. That was actually it for tonight. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Great. So, uh, Jan, thank you so much. Um, just to let everybody know, you may think of questions, uh, you know, uh, after the presentation or when you rewatch the presentation. And so please uh, feel free to send us your questions along um, in the coming days. So we've just got another minute to wrap things up. Uh, so I'd like to extend our sincerest appreci appreciation to Janet for joining us this evening. Janet, you do such an incredible job of delivering a sensitive topic and a matter of fact approach that's easy to understand. And it's because of caring professionals like yourself that we're able to offer sessions like this at no cost to our community. I'd also like to thank the rest of you for being with us. Uh, we hope you gain some new information this evening that can be applied uh, in your own relationships. Um, I know that I learned a lot this evening myself personally. And uh, please be reminded that you will receive a recording of this webinar as well as a feedback survey over the next few days. So we do ask you take a few moments to complete that survey so we can continually improve the services we offer here at Bladder Cancer Canada. Uh, but should you find that you need information or support of a more general or emotional nature at any time throughout your journey, Please keep in mind we have a one-to-one -one, uh, peer support volunteer, a peer, one-to-one -one peer support program with volunteers who are trained and available to help you. So just call, email, or connect with us anytime. And we also, just a reminder, have that discussion forum available where you can ask questions, and uh, and our newsletter, which uh, is available to subscribe to at bladdercancercanada.org. So that's it for me, Tammy Northam, your executive director. I'm wishing you all well this evening and uh, ask that you uh, please stay in touch and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody.